I'm Shivangi from the ODAF team, and today we will be discussing a topic that has been requested by many of our followers. We received many DMs and emails regarding this topic, and that is how to protect your child from some of the most common childhood illnesses. When we fall sick as adults, we tend to take it easy and we only seek medical attention when we really need it and when it gets serious. Um, however, that is not advised sometimes. But um, when it comes to our child, um, as soon as like the smallest thing or like the slightest change is noticed, um, parents seem to uh, worry about it. So, and we have a lot of questions around it also. So to answer some of our questions on childhood illnesses, we have Dr. Hashir Arif with us. Um, Dr. Hashir graduated from King's College London of uh, Medicine and Dentistry London and has been working in pediatrics since 1999. He obtained his CCT, which is a certificate of completion in specialist training in 2007, having worked at many, many of London's uh, world-renowned teaching hospitals such as King's College Hospital, St. George's Hospital, St. Thomas's Hospital and the Royal College, um, sorry, Royal London Hospital. In 2008, he was appointed as um, consultant pediatrician at West Middlesex University Hospital, seeing children with all pediatric conditions, in addition to being the neonatal lead in um, charge of the neonatal unit dealing with the care of newborn term and preterm babies. During his time at um, WMA, WMUH, which is the West Middlesex University Hospital. He was an honorary um, senior lecturer at Imperial College London too, um, where he was teaching undergraduate medical students. In 2011, Dr. Arif uh, moved, to, um, moved on to becoming a consultant pediatrician, providing comprehensive pediatric service at St. Bernard's Hospital, including asthma, eczema, and ADHD clinics. Um, Dr. Arif is a fellow of the uh, Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health, and He's also an instructor um, on the UK Resuscitation Council's Newborn Life Support course and has published and has been published in the British Medical Journal. He is on the GMC and SLMC Specialist Register. It is an absolute pleasure, Doctor, um, and an honor to have you with us today. Um, I know how busy you are. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time of your busy schedule to be with us today and, and answer some of the most uh, asked questions. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you, Doctor. So if you don't mind, um, I would love to jump straight into the questions. Um, also, to the viewers, if you guys um, have any questions that you would like to ask Dr. R, please send it to us via DMs or the comment section below, and I will definitely ask him. So, Doctor, if you're ready, can I jump straight into the questions? Yeah, sure. Sure. Um, so the first question I have, Doctor, is febrile convulsions, which is febrile um, seizures, um, seems to be the hot topic these days in the pediatric care. What is it? Um, I know it happens when the child has like a high fever, but what are its symptoms and what causes this? Also, what should a parent do if the child is showing such symptoms? So um, febrile convulsions are very, very common and causes a lot of anxiety to the parents. Uh, the most important thing is not to panic, okay? When your child is seizing, um, uh, parents tend to get all excited and they, they lose sight and focus of uh, uh, what's going on in front of them. So the most important thing is not to panic. Um, febrile convulsions are, let me just give you a bit of background about febrile convulsions. It, it's, it's, it's fairly common um, in children under the age of five, generally, okay? So um, around 5% of children, uh, all of uh, uh, in the age group um, zero to um, uh, five years uh, may uh, experience a febrile conversion at some point in their lives. So uh, it's, it's a common condition and it occurs due to a sudden rise in, in temperature. Okay, so the first time you may know that your child is ill is when, when the child is having a febrile convulsion. Um, it doesn't cause brain damage in the main, uh, which is what parents fear. Um, they, it doesn't cause, have any long-term issues. It, usually the child um, outgrows it after the age of five. Um, uh, it becomes rarer. Very rarely we do see some children age six, seven or eight even having a febrile convulsion, uh, but it, it's, it's much rarer beyond the age of five. Um, so uh, going back to the, 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 
pathophysiology, it, it is a sudden rise in temperature that causes it. Um, underlying illness may be due to various reasons, due to viral illnesses, bacterial infections. Um, but if, if it's a simple febrile convulsion, it usually lasts for a few um, moments, really, sometimes. A few seconds, a minute, two minutes max. Majority of the time, it's, it's, a, it's a few minutes. Uh, sometimes it can be prolonged and um, up to 15 minutes it's defined as a simple febrile convulsion. If it goes on beyond that or if the child is having multiple convulsions uh, um, uh, within a period of time, then it's defined as a complex febrile convulsion. Nevertheless, it doesn't cause any brain damage as most parents fear. Uh, the most important thing I tell parents is not to panic and to keep an eye on the clock, okay? And usually turn this child over to the left side uh, in the recovery position and just generally uh, keep a uh, uh, track of time. Um, within a minute or two, the, uh, the child may come out of it and may feel a bit drowsy soon after. Uh, but you, uh, I tell the parents to then quietly get the child checked uh, to see if there's a reason for the febrile illness in the first place. If your child has already been seen by a doctor and it is, is ill, you don't have to rush them back to see the, seeing the doctor, but you can uh, get in touch with your doctor and explain that this has happened. Um, as I said before, it doesn't cause any brain damage or anything like that. Uh, medication wise, if it's going beyond five minutes, you need to take the child to the emergency so that we can administer uh, medication to terminate the seizure. So the child will have a either a, a, a increased tone in the ba child's uh, body or start convulsing as a tonic tonic seizure. So that's what a febrile convulsion is. And um, uh, that's how the child should be managed. Um, the, as I said, the most important thing is not to panic um, and then parents do try to bring the child's temperature down at that time, but I don't see that helping too much. The, once the seizure uh, kicks in, uh, it sort of resolves on its own generally within a minute or two. Uh, but if it doesn't, the child needs to be rushed into hospital so that we can medicate, etc. Um, there's a lot of controversy into as, as to prevention of uh, febrile convulsions. Um, there isn't much you can do in terms of, apart from uh, controlling the child's fever during febrile illnesses. If a child has had a febrile convulsion, he's, he or she is very likely to have another one um, at, at, a, at a future date. So just, just being aware and uh, trying to control the child's temperature is, is the main main challenge for the parent. Great. Thank you so much for that, doctor, um, for all the tips and for explaining um, the science behind it. Um, thank you for that. Um, just jumping straight into the second question I had, doctor, was it's around um, roundworms, um, the roundworm infection, which seems to be very, very common among children who live in households with huge gardens and often play with their pets. So yeah. what are the early symptoms of this disease and what precautions must parents take to protect their children from this infection? So I think uh, hygiene, uh, in a word, hygiene is the most important thing. Um, washing your child's hands before eating, um, after going to the garden, etc. So the roundworm eggs are uh, transmitted and um, consumed by the child when they play with in soil, etc. So because uh, the, the roundworm um, eggs and feces get mixed in and is, is, um, uh, is, is uh, contaminating soil and in the gardens, etc. So when a child plays uh, out in, in, in the garden, uh, they come back in and they, you know, often hand goes right in, straight into their mouths and then they infect, they consume those eggs. And then the child gets infected with the, the, uh, the roundworm, which develops into a, into a worm. And, and can stay in the body for, for, for quite some time. So the symptoms are very, very non-specific. You know, the child may have tummy pain, uh, may have loss of appetite, may have uh, breathing difficulties, uh, if it, I mean, depending on which uh, area of the body the roundworm is infecting. Um, so um, again, it is something that you need to have a, a low index of suspicion, but, uh, uh, 
consider when when your child is complaining of tummy pain or um, itchy bottoms etc so um, so um, it is something that is become topical these days um, uh, but um, uh, generally good hygiene can prevent such infestation making sure your child's fingernails are, are clipped and and uh, um, good hand hygiene and, and hand washing uh, will prevent such infestations. Treatment is, is pretty simple on, on suspicion unless you see the child vomits out the worm, etc. Uh, sometimes empirically treatment is, is given to the child. Great, thank you doctor for that. Um, I, I'm sure that would have like um, solved a lot of concerns that most parents have had um, we've got some DMs also regarding this so thank you for clarifying that um, moving on to the next question doctor um, multi-system inflammatory syndrome is another topic that's been um, that's that's pretty common these days amongst the children and a lot of the uh, and it's very common to be discussed around the parenting community also recently so what signs should parents look out for when it comes to the when it comes to multi-system inflammatory syndrome and is the severity the same with children as it is with adults or is there a difference in it well um, we know very little about it to be honest we're still learning uh, there's a lot of uh, information that's still coming out so what it is 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 uh, uh, associate it is what MISC is, is the acronym for it. Uh, so multi-system inflammatory uh, syndrome of, uh, in childhood, uh, in children, that's where the C comes in, uh, is um, a post-COVID phenomenon. So it, it, there's a temporal relationship to a child who's had a COVID infection. You may not know that the child's had a COVID infection and the child can present with this illness. So the child often presents with very high fever, gastrointestinal symptoms like uh, tummy pain, loose motion, uh, very unwell looking. Um, uh, high, child could be in shock with low blood pressure, heart involvement uh, with a very high heart rate, uh, etc. Um, and have breathing difficulties uh, and respiratory symptoms as well. May have a rash, may have uh, enlarged uh, lymph nodes, uh, may have conjunctivitis uh, as, as well. So it is, it is a, a, it potentially quite a serious illness, um, but nevertheless, I must say that it's still very rare. Um, maybe uh, the, the, the numbers are thought to be about one in 5,000 children who've had COVID uh, can present with this illness. So it's a very similar illness to Kawasaki's disease, which we've known about for years and managed quite, quite well um, uh, and um, the, the treatment is with immunoglobulins and supportive treatment the child may even need to be in intensive care uh, we also consider steroids to treat the, the, the illness um, so it is it is a very uh, new illness that we are seeing post covid um, very similar to kawasaki's disease but not quite uh, management is similar um, but yeah, we're learning more and more about it uh, as time goes on. There's more publication in the literature, um, and colleagues who deal with intensive care, uh, who, uh, children in intensive care are learning more and getting more experienced with it. So, uh, um, it, so parents should, shouldn't be alarmed, uh, should just generally look out for uh, high fever, lethargy, uh, diarrhea, vomiting, etc., and then uh, have, a, have a, uh, some level of suspicion if, if, you have, if you've known to have had COVID previously. Um, so, great, great. Thank you, doctor. That was very, very helpful. Um, sorry? Sorry, doctor, you're going to say something? <laughs> Okay, sorry. Um, that was really helpful, doctor. Thank you. Um, moving on to the next question. Um, I know you said it was a very broad topic, but childhood asthma is another pressing matter, which is very common um, among ch children. And it's something that concerns a lot of parents also. But what are the causes of asthma for, um, in young children? Um, and is this something that can be prevented? So, um, I, 
cause per se, there isn't a, 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 a one single cause for uh, a child developing asthma. It's multifactorial. So um, genetics play a huge role. So if there's a strong family history, you're more likely to develop uh, asthma as a child. Um, also, um, the environment and triggers as well. So if you're uh, exposed to several uh, trigger factors like allergens, um, pollution, et cetera, asthma is on the rise. I mean, we are seeing lots and lots of children with wheezing and uh, difficulty breathing, chest tightness. Those are the symptoms pretty much. Nocturnal cough, um, et cetera. So the, the incidence is increasing. We are seeing more of it. Uh, perhaps due to lifestyle changes that uh, uh, we're seeing compared to about 50 years ago, uh, general uh, pollution, um, etc. So um, as a single cause, there isn't one. Prevention, um, again, if you can identify your, your trigger factors, etc. And, and staying clear of them, then that helps. Uh, there is no no one way of sort of modulating uh, the, the disease process or severity as such, but uh, with medication and, and uh, 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 general um, strategies, we, we do manage children quite well and uh, manage to make sure that children don't, I mean, the mortality rates have come down considerably compared to, to many years ago. Um, so children may present with uh, acute exacerbation of their wheeze uh, when we have to uh, even consider inhalers uh, for them and put them on preventers. So generally inhalers are broadly categorized into two broad uh, forms. One is the immediate bronchodilators or relievers to give immediate relief. And then you have preventers, which you take to prevent you from having uh, severe attacks. Um, so um, yeah, asthma management um, is, 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 uh, is, is a bit of an art really. So you have to fine tune it and individualize it to, to the, the patient. Um, and uh, a detailed history is very, very important. Interesting. Thank you, doctor. Um, based on some of your previous um, answers, you said like you were talking about treatment options. Um, Antibiotics and the use of antibiotics in children. Um, I know it's a, uh, it's a topic that's been debated um, around the world also. What is your take on it? And are there, in, like, should parents be aware of anything like with children taking antibiotics at such a young age? Is there anything around that you would like to discuss? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> interesting question. Um, antibiotics has really revolutionized our management of patients and infectious diseases. It has made a huge difference in, in uh, reducing mortality and, and, and death and uh, morbidity and illness, etc. So, um, but it has to be, it has its place really, you know, you need to use it judiciously. Uh, I, for one, am very, very cautious about using antibiotics. I don't dive in with antibiotics. Especially in Sri Lanka, there is a culture of wanting antibiotics for any illness. If it's a viral illness, antibiotics don't work. So don't go asking for antibiotics because there's no point. Uh, it doesn't make the illness, you know, uh, make the child recover faster. Um, it doesn't affect the illness in any way or form. Only, uh, I mean, it can be more harmful to the child because uh, indiscriminate use of antibiotics can lead to more resistance. Uh, organisms emerging and have difficulty uh, managing that. So your child who had been on antibiotics on several courses of antibiotics may uh, have a simple infection for which he may not respond to antibiotics. And then you're, you're in trouble and needing to use uh, uh, stronger or, or uh, higher doses of antibiotics that uh, uh, can be potentially toxic to the child. So um, I think um, I, I, for one, am very, very judicious in my uh, prescription of antibiotics. Um, I, I may see about 30, 40 children a day, but there will be only one prescription for antibiotics, really. Um, because, I mean, it's quite easy to prescribe an antibiotic. It takes me two seconds to prescribe it. 
but that's not the, the challenge. The challenge is to monitor the child and make sure the child isn't having a bacterial infection that requires antibiotics because majority of the child, the, uh, of the time the child is having a viral illness that will resolve on its own. So just uh, trying to, to, to tease out the ones that require antibiotics is the challenge and is the skill. So that's where uh, you have to be uh, cautious. Very interesting. Thank you for that, doctor. Um, I hope some parents got the answer that they needed for that. Um, this leads me on to my next question. Um, I know at a young age, you're supposed to give a series of vaccinations, uh, which are compulsory and some might think optional. I could be wrong. I'm sorry. I'm not too sure. But what is your take on vaccinations and how important is it to get your child vaccinated? So I think uh, vaccinations are very important. Uh, they prevent all these major illnesses that have been sort of uh, lurking around for years. I mean, there are certain conditions like diphtheria and things that we, we don't see anymore due to a good uh, vaccination program. Um, so I think um, uh, there is a bit of vaccine hesitancy where, where families tend to uh, there are certain families who would sort of not want their child vaccinated. Um, but I think vaccinations are, are, are very important and I'm very supportive of it. Uh, but um, uh, so at least uh, I would encourage parents to at least follow our um, EPI uh, program so that they get at least the mandatory vaccines that's in the schedule. Um, any additional vaccines, uh, there are uh, pros and cons of, use, uh, of uh, getting them. So it is best to discuss with your doctor about uh, what your child needs. So uh, basically, um, at least the, the uh, schedule, uh, completing the child's uh, vaccine schedule would make sure that the child is protected from uh, the majority of the nasty illnesses that can be prevented. Great, great. Thank you, doctor. Um, I would like to take a question um, that came in via DM. So um, anonymous user has asked us a question. Um, they've said that um, how they know that there are different types of coughs that a baby could have. How do you watch out um, for a cough which could be bad? Like when do you take action? And how do you differentiate between the different types of coughs? So good question. So um, I Children do cough for a variety of reasons. They do it habitually as well. Um, and, and, and newborns, uh, uh, sorry, when I may say newborns, um, sort of six month plus babies, they can even cough for a bit of attention. So, you know, you, you parents get caught out quite uh, uh, and worried quite uh, uh, unnecessarily sometimes. Um, so the most important thing uh, to remember is, is your child well? If your child is well and has a cough, it's nothing to be alarmed about. Um, important to look at the child's general level of breathing and feeding, depending on the age of the child. If your child's appetite is good, activity levels are good, just an occasional cough here and there is nothing to, to worry about. But if the cough is, is causing them to have shortness of breath, uh, difficulty breathing, uh, what I mean by difficulty breathing is there's uh, obvious evidence that the child is in difficulty in terms of in drawing between the, the child's ribs or below the child's rib cage, or the child's breathing rate is high, then you would need to get uh, some medical attention. Um, so, multiple causes of coughs, um, majority of them will resolve without any medication, okay? So try to sit it out and, and see if your child actually needs any medication before rushing to your doctor. Uh, but um, uh, as I said, cough can be a symptom of asthma as well from, from our previous discussion. Um, so if the child is wheezing or having difficulty breathing or shortness of breath, then asthma needs to be, be considered. Um, so, uh, in the main, use your instinct. If your uh, if your child uh, is feeding well and and thriving and and happy, um, uh, the cough may settle on its own. 
Great, thank you, Doctor. Um, I'm sure that was um, that was very helpful for the for the mother who asked uh, via DMs. Also, um, just take just another question that I had. I know um, weaning and sleep schedule. Sometimes some techniques don't work for certain parents. Sorry, I, I uh, there was a there was a problem with the connection. I think that I. Oh, sorry about that. There. Sorry, is it okay now? Yeah, it, it's better now. So okay. you can uh, yeah, repeat the question. Sorry. Yeah. So what I was saying was, um, sleep schedules and weaning um, is a topic that a lot of parents go to, and like a quick search online gives you like a whole loads of different. Um, different methods that parents can um, adopt to. Is there like a specific like, like sequence that they should do in order to get their child sleeping better and stuff? And if one technique doesn't work, should parents be disheartened by it? No, I mean, I think, I think it's if, if you can fall, have a bit of a routine and a structure to what you do, uh, then you don't have to lose uh, much sleep over it. Uh, weaning, um, I encourage parents to wean at six months, that which is the WHO recommendation. Um, so I think the first six months, um, everybody endeavors to exclusively breastfeed their child. May not work for everybody, uh, but uh, I mean, that's, that's kind of the gold standard. Uh, weaning starts at six months. Of course, there is a, a method of uh, infant-led weaning, which is what most uh, um, uh, most um, parents uh, are talking about and thinking about. It, it works well for certain uh, uh, children. So uh, when, when some children don't take to it very easily, I, I advise that the mother offers, a, a, a parents offer a, a hybrid system where from the traditional purees, uh, uh, where you have the lumpier bits going in as well. So it, it's, a, it's a form of a mixed uh, bag. So um, uh, if, you, if you want to try uh, infant lead weaning, just certainly go ahead. That's, it's not a problem. Um, uh, and, and some children do tend to take on to it quite nicely and, and can be um, uh, independent, uh, very independent with their meals, etc. Uh, so the traditional method of purees also works for certain uh, individuals, and um, and uh, yeah, uh, so at six months is 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 the right time to start. Yeah. So in terms hey. of sleeping, uh, um, uh, I uh, I do advise uh, a, a routine and 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 uh, making sure even from six months, if you can, uh, try to get your child to sleep. In their cots, that would be the most the most uh, useful thing to do. Um, uh, very patient uh, parents very easily take take the child onto their bed and go sleep, and and then run into all sorts of problems with with uh, with sleep. Uh, so when when the child reaches about nine months, I I generally uh, advise the parents to to stop feeding them feeding the, the child overnight. So that they they have a have a continuous sleep and then they get used to uh, uh, having an uninterrupted sleep and can soothe and settle themselves quite easily. Uh, also, children uh, who come off the feed overnight feed at nine months tend to do better in terms of eating and 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 continuing to eat, whereas uh, those who are very dependent on on milk feeds overnight tend to stay fussy. Um, uh, uh, for uh, right into the toddler years. Yeah. Great, um, thank you for that, for that, doctor. I know we've come to the end of our time, but we've got a few more questions that have come through. So if you don't mind, um, should I ask them? Yeah, sure, go on. Um, so one of the questions that came through DMs was um, the use of multivitamins for kids. Is it necessary? and and again, uh, I may be the only one, but I'm not a huge fan of just uh, uh, starting multivitamins as a knee-jerk reaction. I individualize it to, to each patient, each child, and then, uh, 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 
yeah, as I said, it's not something that I do. Uh, it's not my practice to um, automatically start children on multiple times. Right, great. Thank you for that, doctor. One more um, question is how to prevent common cold sore throat and coughs during a time like this? Is there any best practices that parents so, can follow? Uh, yeah, I mean, good nutrition. Good nutrition is, is good. Um, keeping your child hydrated. And if the child is over the age of one, um, a teaspoon of honey helps. Okay, so that's very, uh, uh, it has lots of medicinal properties. Again, uh, uh, we spoke about cough and etc. So honey is something that I advocate and, and, and uh, uh, advise parents to, to use in the first instance as a home remedy for multiple things for sore throats, etc. Um, much, much before antibiotics are prescribed for the sore throat. Um, so, um, yeah, um, generally just good nutrition and hand washing, etc., et will prevent uh, your child from catching and passing on these little common colds and things like that. Yeah. Great. Thank you for that, doctor. Um, there's a lot of questions that have come through, but I've only, I'm only going to ask one or two um, and then we can close up. Um, one other question that came through was how many months gap should I have in giving worm treatment to my two-year-old child? Is there like a specific time gap? Uh, again, another interesting one. Um, I, I don't routinely do the whole deworming business as, as it's commonly done. Um, uh, I think looking out for, uh, 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 you know, the child's itchy bottoms and symptoms is, is, is more useful. And then, so those children who get this six monthly business also still get worm infections. So that's, that's why I, I don't uh, sort of personally believe in just uh, poisoning your child every six months. So I, I tend to, uh, to, to wait and see if they're symptomatic or, or if they've not had it for a while, yes, then uh, a deworming course will work, but uh, not, not routine. Great. Um, another one was regarding the vaccines. It's a follow up from your vaccine question that I asked earlier. In specifically, they're asking about the flu vaccine and its benefits and if it's needed. Mm. Flu vaccines is, is useful. Um, there is some evidence that, well, it doesn't work against COVID, but uh, it, uh, there is some evidence that it, it uh, reduces the, 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 the morbidity that uh, you may have with COVID. So, generally the flu vaccine is encouraged currently in this pandemic. Great, great. Thank you, doctor. And the last question I'll be taking from the viewers with is around um, how can I know how, can I know how to prevent colic and what steps should be taken to cure it? Uh, interesting question. So um, colic is very, very common. Um, so we, we see it in, 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 in our day-to-day -day practice quite, uh, quite, quite a bit. So um, colic, by definition, is, is uh, inconsolable crying for no apparent reason. Um, by definition, um, uh, for more than three uh, days in a week, for more than three weeks. So that's, that's how it's defined. Um, uh, so... Um, why do children get colic? Nobody knows. Um, there are certain um, food items in the mother's diet that can trigger it. Um, certainly shellfish consistently tends to do that. So uh, I always advise mothers to stay clear uh, for, uh, with their shellfish. Um, uh, and um, and, uh, and, um, and then there is no specific treatment for colic, but there are certain uh, methods we can use to sort of minimize the effect of the child, uh, the effect of the colic on the child and, and the family. So certain positions the child may adopt may soothe the child uh, during these colicky spells. Uh, uh, we do administer probiotics uh, to prevent and treat colic. Um, and um, uh, certain, uh, you know, methods such as massaging the baby, etc., will minimize the symptoms of colic during these colicky uh, spells. Um, so, 
Um, colic is, is quite common, but I think uh, I encourage mothers and fathers uh, to not to lose too much hair and sleep because uh, um, they um, uh, children do uh, to grow, do grow out of it. So it will pass. Okay, so it starts at around the age of two weeks and, and peaks at about six weeks. And by three to four months, uh, babies do settle. There are some babies who will go on for much, uh, for a bit longer, but generally in the main, it settles. Great, thank you for that, doctor. And this takes us to the last question, uh, which is one of my questions. Um, what advice would you give parents who are skeptical about taking their kids to the doctors, um, especially during these uncertain times, uh, what is your advice on that? Um, so, uh, well, I think, you know, just avoid unnecessary visits for sure, because, uh, you know, this is not the time to be just, uh, you know, gallivanting and uh, uh, coming into the hospital, which is, you know, uh, full of infections. So um, uh, if you do have to come, uh, make sure, I mean, I, I'm seeing, I see a lot of families bringing the whole family along and uh, the extra siblings, just, you know, minimize your visit and, and, and uh, you know, make sure that it's, it's absolutely necessary. Um, um, that's, that's pretty much it, really. I mean, just making sure that it, it, it is necessary. And, and I'm sure you, you would want to point out that uh, video consultations may uh, may minimize those visits, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, doctor, you've said my point. <laughs> but um, that takes us, uh, that brings us to the end of our conversation. Thank you so much, doctor. You've answered so many questions um, and uh, so many, you've given so many tips and like so much explanation around a lot of things that a lot of parents have been confused about. So thank you so much for that. Um, so uh, to the viewers, I'm sorry, I couldn't make all the yeah, just to the viewers, I'm so sorry, I couldn't take all your questions as due to time constraint. But if you would like to speak to Dr. Um, Hashir Arif, um, you can always consult him via ODOC. He's available on the app. Um, so with that, once again, Doctor, thank you so much for taking the time um, to, be with, to be with us today and answering all our questions. It was an honor and a pleasure to have you. Um, so with that, it's time for us to sign off, guys. Um, if you have any topics that you would like us to explore in our future webinar series, please uh, feel free to send us a DM or drop us a message um, with the topic you would like us to speak about and who you would like to see on these webinars. So until then, it's me, Shivange, from Team ODOC signing off. Stay indoors and stay safe. Thank you. <laughs>